I mean, it's like, or like 30 years, so like, uh, I'm pretty new here. Uh, but my, my wife, you know, she, uh, her, her name was uh, Kreiser before she, uh, you know, she married this sucker. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but she, uh, so her family's been in this area for a really long time. And, uh, you know, so I, I was really, uh, really grateful that, you know, when we were uh, start meeting each other and start being able to be in this area more to appreciate the love of the history that is in this area. And I've always really just enjoyed that part of it. I mean, it's great to see a room full of people who really like to talk about history because I'm a history nerd myself. Uh, but enough about that, uh, you know, I'm the curator collection manager at uh, Hocho Kata T. C can you guys say that? Say Hocho Kata T. Hocho Kata T. Good, good. See, you guys say it. I mean, you guys are really good at it. Uh, and I mean, uh, Fred did really good too. I mean, I think, uh, and he didn't, get, uh, he didn't get that little lesson there. So we have to give him a little bit of kudos for that. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, what I do there is, uh, you know, uh, the, the Shakopee Metawaka and Sioux community does have a collection of objects that are cared for and stored and, you know, put on exhibit at Hochakata Tea. And our jo job there is to care for the objects and to acquire new objects as well and to, you know, make sure that the community is, uh, has access to that collection. And so that's something that's really important. Uh, for us as staff there to remember that that building was really created for the community to really be able to uh, provide access to those things for the, the community because nothing uh, like that had ever been uh, done before. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm, uh, you know, I'll say the, the person that you're going to watch is our director, uh, Andy Vig, who recently gave an interview on a podcast called Native uh, Minnesota and is interviewed by the Secretary Treasurer of the um, community, Rebecca Crook Stratton. Uh, Andy Vig, if the name sounds familiar, uh, you may be uh, you remembering his father, Charlie Vig, is the chairman of the community uh, in past years. And so uh, Andy was really uh, integral into building Hochakata Tea. Uh, was really one of the main people who provided not only language translations, but also provided insight into what the exhibit should say. You know, telling the story of Dakota, uh, telling Dakota history through an exhibit is not a traditional storytelling uh, manner that Dakota people would, would do. That's not how they, you know, transmit that knowledge. And so doing that in, in an exhibit, you know, it took a lot of work, took a lot of, you know, thinking about how best to do it. And so Andy uh, really is one of the best people really to speak about that. Uh, there will be a, a second video here that's another gentleman that I have a whole lot of respect for. His name is uh, Leonard Wabasha. He's our director of cultural resources and uh, did a lot of work with the collection and as well as provided a lot of insight on projects that, you know, we do every day. Uh, a lot of what we do at Hochakata Tea is we do a lot of outreach to organizations, you know, such as yourselves, county historical societies, and local people that are really just trying to do their best in telling, uh, telling that history. Uh, you know, I look at, you know, some of the books up here, and, you know, when I was, you know, get, just getting started off in about, you know, like 2010 is uh, when, I, when I graduated, uh, my professor, uh, Mary Wingard actually wrote this book, and this was a really kind of, you know, it was kind of uh, on the heels of the 150th anniversary of the U.S. Dakota conflict, which was in 2012. And for me, that was a really big turning point because then you really saw a lot more, uh, a, a lot more focus on presenting or giving Dakota people the chance to tell that history. I mean, we talk a lot about those, uh, you know, Dennis did really good, I think, in talking about some of those place names. Uh, you know, from Kaposia, that's in, you know, South St. Paul, to uh, Bede Mayato, which is, you know, what the name of Prior Lake was, you know, Blue Bank Lake, uh, Makato, Blue Earth, you know, and even, you know, some that aren't, uh, you know, Dakota, but may relate to Dakota history, like uh, Beltrami County, for instance, Giacomo Beltrami, that Italian explorer that was here, and documented, uh, you know, tried to document the headwaters of the Mississippi, you know, and uh, along the way they met a lot of Dakota Anishinaabe people 
who you know offered uh, their thoughts about the land and their interactions with those different uh, individuals. So uh, Joseph Nicollet Joseph uh, did mention that as well was really you know important in documenting some of those place names and uh, even Paul Durand, you may be familiar with that name, also created a map that seeks to document a lot of those place names as well. So that's something that a lot of people are interested in and uh, something that you know you can learn a lot about if you you know come to Ho Chi Minh City. We are located in uh, Shakopee, so it's really you know pretty close to here, and so that's one thing that we would really love uh, you know to have you guys all there and uh, able to you know learn from what the community was able to uh, to put together. Uh, yeah. I had a quick question. Sure. Where did the name Minnewakan come from? I mean, growing up in high school, you know, I heard about Cherokee, Apache, Sioux, Dakota. Where did Minnewakan come from? I never know. So uh, Minnewakan, and so the uh, question, great question, and it's actually the first question that's uh, pretty much answered like right outside the exhibit. Uh, you know, Minnewakan, Minnewakan. Uh, you know, dwellers of Spirit Lake, and so that you know name, you know Mide Lake Wakan, like Spirit, uh, Holy Tumwan, like to dwell, so to dwell Spirit Lake, and so if you think of that name, Spirit Lake, and we always ask people where they think that is, because it's an actual place, you know that is Malax, and so that's where that place is in reference to, and so that's where that name comes from. And so, you know, kind of a bonus question or bonus uh, contribution here too is, you know, in past times that name has been translated to Mystic Lake. So if you're wondering like, oh, why does that call that? You know, that it's reflecting of the people that built that place. So uh, even uh, so a lot of people sometimes be like, oh, I, you know, I lived here all my life and I, I don't know why that name was there or what that means, but uh, that is what uh, Metawakanton means. And uh, so, uh, Kick it off, uh, or anybody. Uh, so we are open Wednesday through Saturday, uh, 10 to 4. Many voices, you know, from our community, and 
so they we really worked hard on it. You know that. No, it's a wonderful exhibit. It's a, you know, I love that it starts out with the creation story and kind of the TV uh, sort of feel, and, and the digital art is really beautiful, but I think the exhibit as a whole is really powerful. I mean, I remember the first time I really walked through it, um, you know, there were some spots where it caught my breath and, you know, definitely brought up some emotions and some tears even in some cases. So, um, yeah, I encourage people, it is open to the general public, uh, so, and, and school groups. Yeah, yeah. Uh... We're, we're kind of still running on limited hours, but it's uh, like Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to, to 4. Um, but certainly the schools have been showing up and uh, the general public, and it's just been a, a great um, educational tool to use. And so, yeah, the public is, is welcome, and uh, we've got to meet so many great people. So, yeah, we, we definitely, it's a great asset to have in the community to share a little bit more about Dakota people. Um, so in addition to the exhibit, uh, we get to do some really fun things, and you're working on uh, a project right now or an event, a Dakota Language Bowl. Um, you've been very involved with the language over the years. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the language? I'm going to pull ahead a little further along in the video. I um, talk a little bit about how important it is for, for us to be together as a community and, and some of the things we can share when we are able to come together. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that one of the biggest things is uh, with our Dakota um, culture is, you know, the oral teachings that we have and really needing to be together uh, to learn, you know, to learn our languages, to learn, you know, how we, um, you know, how we prepare food, um, how we make things that are important to our culture. Um, but then just to be together to celebrate, you know, our what she be just a great time to, um, you know, to hear our songs, uh, to see our dance, uh, dance, uh, dancers, you know, in our youth, you know, just the friendships that they make. And, you know, we grew up uh, running around the neighborhoods, and I, I just don't know if, if uh, we're seeing as much of that. But to encourage them to come here, you, you get to see them uh, interact with each other, and that's really nice to build those relationships. And a lot of them are cousins, you know, they just uh, sometimes they, they don't get to spend enough time with each other. So, yeah, this building just it provides a lot of opportunity for our community. It's really exciting. We're actually going to do a little walking tour and show a little bit of the exhibit here. So um, anything else before we wrap up and, and take the show on the road? No, I just, uh, just happy we have a home for our community to come together. Me too. Andy and I are here in the front entrance of Hocho Hadati, and Andy's going to tell us a little bit about the building. Nidakia B. Wana Hocho Hadati Benyami. You're here at the lodge at the center of the camp. Um, this is our uh, gathering place for our community, and it also has a public exhibit that we're going to go through today and uh, a gift shop. So uh, if you make your way out, um, this is the space that you'll see, and uh, happy to have visitors come here. Uh, we're here in the exhibit, Midwakton Dwellers of the Spirit Lake. Uh, the scene you just saw is a summer camp, and Andy is here to tell us a little bit about uh, the structure we're standing in front of and a little more uh, about the scene we just saw. Yeah, so uh, our season is called Madoketu, our summer, and so we have an example of our dwellings in the summertime, which is uh, Summer Bark Lodge. Uh, inside the Bark Lodge, you'll see some of our traditional foods, and as well as uh, pre-contact uh, weaponry. So in this area in the exhibit, we're showcasing our uh, Waniatu, which is winter, 
and uh, Dakota uh, Buffalo High TV. And this is where we tell some of our stories. Uh, and then we transition over into the springtime, and we're focusing on uh, tapping of maple trees for their syrup. We're here at the tail end of the exhibit. Uh, we kind of skipped through some of the parts, but wanted to showcase the beginning, how the exhibit follows the seasons, and show you some of the tradi more traditional um, culture pieces of the museum. But there is also uh, a lot of history that's included. Uh, the Dakota Board is a big part in the boarding school era. Um, but as we wind through, uh, from past to present, we end up here, uh, which is all about uh, modern day Shakopee Midwakton Sioux community. So, Andy, will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this really is a popular area. Um, oftentimes, you don't see a lot of uh, current state of tribes, so the exhibit really does a good job of, uh, of showing you know, where the Shakopee Midwakton people are at today and you know, still here. Absolutely. Well, Andy, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast today and for giving us a little glimpse of the exhibit here. Um, hopefully folks will uh, be inspired to come out and take a peek. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. From uh, the top tab there, Fred, uh, go up. Up, up, yeah, just click right there. All right. That's my arm. Today I'd like to begin with some of the uh, tools that were used for farming. This small item is a part of an antler. It was used for softening up the ground, scraping and digging. This, this item is a elk antler and it was used for basically poking a hole in the earth so seeds could be planted and fertilizer could be added. This is a deer scapula and this item would have been made into a hole and, and used for hoeing the ground. It was also used in the high processing. Moving on, this is an example of the scapula hole. Before they began using scapula or bone tools, they had stone tools. This is an example of a stone roll that was found near Lake Minnetonka. Aside from farming, the Dakota people had to cloak themselves, and so they used other parts of the animal um, for making their clothes and uh, containers and other items of daily necessity. For example, they would use some of the hide to make sheaths for their knives. This is a bone-handled knife made from a, a scythe. This is a small, smaller version of a, a knife case decorated with pink tinkler shells. 
that come, came from the trading. Uh, this tool is made from an elk antler, and it's a scraper flushing tool. Um, this would be used on large areas of the hide, and then as they got to the edges of the hide, they would use these small stone scrapers to help remove the flesh. Um, these are examples of moccasins that would be made from the hide, decorated um, with beads. These are more of a contemporary item or decoration, and these hides would be made or decorated with both bead and quill work. Quill came from porcupine or bird. Other items that were used were antler from the buffalo. This is an example of a buffalo horn spoon or ladle that's been decorated and carved with an eagle head. Uh, specific items like this would sometimes be used only for ceremonial feasting. To sew some of these items together, attaching the beads and etc., they would make thread from sinew of the animal. The sinew was also used for their bowstrings. Here we have two examples of bowstrings. One has been colored red. <coughs> Other items that were used from the buffalo were its fur. This is buffalo fur. Where'd you get this the metal for the knife? Oh, that would have been from trading. Like a, yeah. A TV pillow or a backrest. Uh, sometimes it would be tied into rope and be used this way. This is how they would. Uh, use for bundling purposes or perhaps even as a bridle for their horse. Because we were a seasonal migratory people who followed the game and, and the seasons of harvest, we needed containers and so some of the hides from the animals that we hunted were used to make items like this quiver which could also be used as a feather case or a small teepee bag with the porcupine quill designs representing the camps moving. When they moved the camp, they would take some of the teepee poles and use them as travois, and so they would leave marks along the prairie or in the earth. Another item from the buffalo was its bladder, which we used as a water container. Or we could make this into something that could hold our quills because quills are very, very sharp, very pointed, but they cannot penetrate the hide of the bladder. Thank you for your time today. We hope that you enjoy taking a look at some of the items that we have housed here at Pocho Cotta Tea. We'll be up. Chi chi up, you Yeah, so uh, like what Leonard was saying, uh, so at Hochakata Tea, you know, it starts in the uh, starts with the creation stories and then goes into the seasons, and you know we have uh, a lot of those seasonal, uh, you know, like tools that would be used at those specific times, you know, for instance, uh, Tinto Tunwe, or you know, like the Prairie Village Shakpe, the Dakota Itanchan, the Dakota leader. There he was, uh, you know, that was uh, that village there, and that a lot of the planting tools would have been used, you know, at a place like that. And then as you go towards, you know, the winter and the spring, you start uh, seeing you know, taps that would have been used. We have, you know, some of those, uh, um, you know, replicas that are there that you can see. And then uh, you can start seeing the uh, beads that were used. So before, like the the very old beads are very large. And then the pony beads, which were called that because they were brought on uh, horse-drawn carriages, they were more uniformly cut before then. Finally are the seed beads, which is what you would typically see on something that's beaded today. Um, and they were called seed beads because they were really small. And the smaller that they got, the more intricate that the designs could get. So that's what you would see on a lot of you know dresses or shirts or things like that. And then uh, you know, when it goes to the, you know, uh, the conflict area and then the boarding schools, uh, there's not really as a lot of many objects that reflect those areas. And then, uh, you know, we go to the contemporary times, which, you know, Andy mentioned in his portion of the video, something that you don't really get to see at a lot of different, you know, museums. 
because a lot of that history is typically focused on the conflict and removal areas. So being able to see you know, what's happening in current day, what do, a tribe does today is really important and was something that the community really wanted you know, uh, expressed to, uh, to visitors that tribes are, you know, uh, native people are still here. They're still doing, you know, still following their traditions, they're modern people, and they express themselves in a variety of ways. And that, you know, early time is really represented by the commodity foods that you'd see, you know, the, uh, you know, there we use canned you know, meat, pork, uh, beef, chicken, and then, uh, you know, sometimes called the brick of gold, which is the, you know, government cheese that's used, but, you know, also connecting that to the rise of, you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and some of the ways that people, Native people are trying to reclaim traditional foods in order to have better, you know, life outcomes and better health outcomes. And then goes to the city of Shakopee, which was, you know, the Indians, and has, you know, some of the, you know, the buttons that were used at that time and discusses the, the name change that came in the 90s when they went from the Indians to the Sabres. And something that was actually really moving to me, one of the probably best, one of the best conversations I ever had was, uh, you know, there was a person that, uh, that was, because uh, it was a 1959 photo of the homecoming court and they were all dressed as native people, you know, non-native people dressed up and they were, you know, dancing around pretending they were native. And, you know, uh, this person came to the exhibit and saw their photo there and they talked to me about what that meant to them and that that was something that their parents taught them was the way to respect Native people. And, you know, after a while they said, you know, you know they said, I reflected on that time, you know, at the ripe young age of 70 and I realized that, you know, that wasn't the way to do it. And so they were really glad that that was there um, because that was, that was a way to kind of show people that, you know, all these things didn't happen a long time ago. You know, it's still pretty, you know, very, uh, very recent, you know, all things considered. And so then, yeah, that kind of goes into that last part that Andy and Rebecca were talking about when you see the, you know, what tribes do today. And so it was really important for the, for the community to have that as part of the exhibit. And really the kind of final thing is, you know, that Native people are still there, still here. And so that's reflected with, uh, you know, a regalia set that's on loan from a tribal member. And so it kind of offers that more contemporary piece to leave people with uh, before, they, uh, before they leave. Do we have any other questions for Yeah. Now, when you go to uh, Mystic Lake, Water Tower's got such a pretty picture of a shield on there. What's the symbolism? The, so the uh, gentleman here asked about the shield. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty recognizable. I think you saw it in the videos. Uh, really, you know, that medicine wheel is really representative of uh, directions and seasons. That's, you know, starting, you know, from the, you know, winter, uh, winter, spring, uh, summer, and fall. And so it goes in there, north, east, south, and west. So that's really, uh, you know, there's feathers on there. It represents the Ocheti Shakoan. Seven Council Fires of the Dakota Yate or Dakota Nation. So it's really, you know, the Petawakatin, the Sisseton, Wapitin, and so it kind of represents all those different bands of the Dakota people. So that's, that's uh, what it represents. Yeah. I heard that they're going to be introducing the bison herd. Uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, any information on the bison herd, uh, but I have heard the, the same thing. So. Uh, you know, I know the, the, the community has been working on it for a long time, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see it, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't, I wish I could work on it, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not on that area. Well, it's, it's really hard to, I guess, uh, you know, I guess the, it's thought more in terms of, you know, the Ocheti, the whole Dakota nation, you know, kind of going up into Canada, all the way kind of down into like the Missouri, the like Oklahoma area, kind of far out west, you know, uh, as well. You know, really the first time that, you know, Dakota, uh, you know, interacted with the uh, Europeans is, uh, you know, at, the, at Lake Superior. And so, you know, even kind of going eastward as well. 
And there's been a lot of, uh, I guess you call it displacement of Native people, especially as you take the 13 colonies and you keep moving west and development keeps on moving uh, west. And so then at a certain time, the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe are kind of permanently displaced into the northern part of Minnesota. The Dakota are almost permanently, uh, permanently you know, uh, at the southern area of Minnesota. And then like the Ho-Chunk, the Sag Fox, uh, Iowa, the EOA, they're you know, put down in their so southern areas. And then the Lakota are kind of pushed out uh, west as well. So I mean, uh, a lot of times they would say, you know, like that northern uh, kind of area of the state uh, would be the Anishinaabe and the southern area would kind of be the, the Dakota and then you know the different bands of the Dakota would be in different areas but there's been so much movement you know typically it's almost kind of thought of in you know uh, just that larger map that kind of shows where you know the Dakota nation would have lived because they've lived in so many different places at a time it's, it, it's almost better to say like you know at this time they lived here at that time they lived you know here primarily but because the territory was so large, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of pinpoint it. But roughly speaking, that's, that's where they, they lived. Any other questions? I wonder if the Midwestern lands are still considered on the reservation. And I also wonder how the agricultural system to the state is on the land. Uh, exact, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, but yeah, on the lands that are on the reservation, yeah, those are the, the, the tribal, the, the, those are the tribe's lands, yeah. Those would be considered part of the reservation. I had a question. Uh, you said for many years before there was written language, the uh, culture and so on is transmitted from the elders to the younger generations. Is that still occurring? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's really the entire reason, uh, well, not the entire reason, but the overarching reason why Hochakata Tea was built was for the community members in order to continue those Dakota lifeways. They never went away. You know, they're always there. You know, uh, one thing I was kind of struck by was, you know, when Hochakata Tea got built and one of the first tours we were giving, people said, someone told me, they're like, it's really great, you know, that the community can learn their history, you know, here. And you know it's kind of like backwards because like no the the community they know that history they put that in there they you know all the stories all the you know history that was really told there is uh, you know from directly from the community and so you know it's uh, yeah it's absolutely being taught you know language is being you know really emphasized there you know lifeways is being uh, you know continuously you know pushed as well through educational programming. And the community has been doing that, uh, but you know when Hochakata Tea was built, they really kind of focused on, you know, hey, we're doing all these things, but they're all over the place. They're not really there's not a central location for the community to do that. So that was really where the over that was really where the need was kind of identified. But the community ha 